Vote counting is underway in Mali, following a violence-marred election. And Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed continues to be warmly received by the Ethiopian diaspora in the U.S. with his message of unity. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu, you at in for Vincent Macquarie. This is Africa 54. Tonight we begin our broadcast in Southern Africa where Zimbabweans are anxiously awaiting the results of Monday's critical election that many hope can turn around their nation's shattered economy and tarnished reputation after 38 years of iron-fisted rule under former President Robert Mugabe. Vote counting is ongoing in the landlocked nation where election observers in Harare reported no major incidents with relatively high turnout across the country. The presidential contest is effectively a two-way race between incumbent Emerson Mnangagwa, who took over after Mugabe's resignation last November, and opposition leader Nelson Chamisa, who expressed concern about balloting in rural areas. Chamisa leads the Movement for Democratic Change Alliance, and Mnangagwa is leader of the ruling ZANU-PF. Now for the latest on what's happening in Harare, VOA's Anita Paul joins us by phone from Harare. Hello, Anita. Hello. Can you bring us up to speed on what's going on on the ground? Sure. Just a few minutes ago, I was in central Harare outside opposition headquarters where several hundred people were singing and dancing and celebrating what they said was a resounding victory in the poll. But what's really important to remember is that official results have not been released yet, certainly not enough to, to support that there actually has been an opposition victory. Anita, there were reports of water cannons and uh, kind of trying to disperse some protesters. What can you tell us? What I can tell you is less than an hour ago, I personally saw five water cannon trucks loaded with Zimbabwean policemen about a block away from where the opposition protesters were celebrating, uh, opposition supporters rather, were celebrating. So this is very much true. They are waiting and it's uh, seen by many as a menacing presence, although many opposition supporters told me we will not be intimidated. We're going to keep celebrating. All right, Anita, we'll catch up with you tomorrow. Thank you so much for bringing us up to speed with what's going on in Harare. VOA's Anita Paul reporting live for us there from Harare. A third party in Mali's presidential election has claimed uh, on Tuesday that its candidate has made it to a run of vote, further complicating a poll that is already beset by violence that stopped thousands from casting their ballots on Sunday. Aliou Diallo's statement follows similar claims on Monday from incumbent president Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, who is seeking a second term and believes he is in the lead while his main rival, Sumaila Sisse's camp, said earlier it has also made it to a second round runoff against him. Mali's conflict began in 2012, forcing tens of thousands of people to flee to neighboring countries. And uh, for more on Mali's election, joining us live via Skype from Bamako is VOA reporter Jack Aristide. Jack, good evening from Bamako, and uh, vote counting is going on, Jack. What do we know? Who is in the lead? Good evening, uh, Esther. Good evening from uh, Bamako. Well, for now, no one can report on numbers coming out of uh, the vote counting. The country's electoral law actually does not allow for anyone present during this process um, to reveal any uh, statistics and candidates, uh, representatives actually in particular, um, you know, they are not allowed to transmit any statis statistics. They, are, they can be present in, uh, during this uh, voting uh, process, but cannot uh, give any stats. Only the Ministry of uh, Territorial Administration have the power to uh, publish uh, the results, which will have to be validated by the Constitutional uh, Court. However, I think you've just given some names. With that said, you know, many expect that by uh, Friday the results will be known, if not even unofficially, by tomorrow, Wednesday. Um, so candidates, um, you know, there are names out there. You've given some of them. The campaign manager for uh, incumbent president, uh, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, 
um, uh, who is seeking, of course, a second term, believes uh, Keita is in the lead. The one for uh, rival uh, Sumaila Sisse says uh, Sisse has uh, made it to uh, the second round, if uh, there is uh, a second round. And then uh, this, uh, the latest one is uh, a candidate in Tycoon, Aliou Diallo. Mm -hmm. um, the campaign manager, spokesperson there, says that uh, Diallo uh, has come second and won enough votes to go into a uh, two uh, candidate second round poll. I mean, if, of course, there is this uh, second round, which should be on the 12th of uh, August. That's so, next month. Jack, a very complex situation so far. But uh, what can you tell us about the security situations? We had about mortar attacks earlier. And uh, general insecurity in the country, has this been contained? Yes, you know, actually, uh, there were great fears uh, that uh, this uh, election uh, would be disrupted by uh, attacks uh, and of course there was uh, there were attacks uh, uh, and which uh, uh, have been claimed by the al qaeda's franchise in uh, the sahara um, so there were attacks on a village in uh, northern mali uh, during uh, the election and uh, election uh, that was uh, disrupted but then authorities uh, Say you know uh, they, um, I mean the the situation was contained almost immediately. Mm -hmm. It was disrupted, but then uh, they could resume mm -hmm. uh, voting after that. Uh, Esther, thank you so much, Jack. Uh, Jack Aristide is VOA's French to Africa reporter, reporting live via Skype from Bamako, Mali. Moving on, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's visit to the U.S. It was to unify his country and has been warmly received by the Ethiopian diaspora. He has received a hero's welcome from thousands of Ethiopians in Washington, Los Angeles and Minneapolis. Abiy has made sweeping reforms less than four months since taking office, boosting civil liberties, releasing political prisoners and ending hostilities with longtime enemy Eritrea. The Ethiopian diaspora see him as a unifying factor and a peacemaker, not just for their country, but for the entire Horn of Africa region. Now, for more perspective on Prime Minister Abiy's visit to the U.S., I'm joined by Nunu Wako, an Ethiopian-American political analyst and international journalist. Nunu, a warm welcome to you to Africa 54. Now, let's start with uh, the address Abi gave to Ethiopians in Washington, D.C. on Saturday, mm -hmm. where he was calling on Ethiopian diaspora to return home. Do you think most of them will heed his call to... You know? Absolutely. Most of us, including myself, are ready to pack our bags and return to Ethiopia and be a part of not just the, two, the duty, but, you know, the sustainable development of Ethiopia. It requires both our efforts as well as the government's effort to develop Ethiopia, reform, and reconstruct the way he has envisioned Ethiopia to be moving forward. You know, we, we are amazed at the speed at which Abiy has made those changes in Ethiopia. I mean, no one could see this coming that soon. But what is the next big item in his agenda? Well, you know, we are looking forward to what the next big item is. Of course, he has toured the diaspora. One of the biggest issues that the government was faced with was the voice of the diaspora. So now that that gap has um, unified with the Ethiopian people and his vision. I think his next agenda is truly to go back, work on the reform. As we all know, reform is not something that happens overnight. It requires work. It requires, um, you know, changing up some registrations. Laws that are in place need to be either completely deleted or rewritten to accommodate the current environment of Ethiopia and the environment that he is genuinely working hard to create. Now his popularity is rising, not just in Ethiopia, the Horn of Africa, but also in East Africa. I mean, seeing him here, you could see a lot of love. You know, he was putting his hand across his chest Absolutely. and people are just, you know, talking about him. But are there those who feel that, oh, no, we don't like it this way? Are there those who disagree? with this kind of sweeping changes that he's making in the country? Absolutely. You know, in, in any environment, something that is happening drastically overnight, there's somebody that is going to disagree with that. And I don't think any leader is prepared to please the entire population that he stands to lead, but majority of the population in, in Ethiopia, out of 100 million, I'm, I'm certain that 99 are behind him. No, no. One of the major moves that uh, Abi has made is to restore relations with Eritrea. And, and the other thing that we've seen is reuniting the families. What has this moment been like for 
Eritreans and Ethiopians, some, you know, are just family members being able to get together for the first time in so many years. You know, it, it is an emotional moment for both Ethiopia and Eritreans, for us to sit back and just witness families that have been separated, some left in Ethiopia and some has been, um, you know, told to relocate to Eritrea when Eritrea got its independence and I have not been able to see their families for over 27 years. It is, it has been the most emotional three months of our life that I could tell you. Uh, and, it, and I'm happy to see their relationship mended. It was both draining economically for both Eritrea and in Ethiopia, emotionally the most, uh, you know, Touching. Gut wrenching experience that in, we in, have endured. In 30 seconds. Yes. How would you sum up who is Abi Ahmed? Abi Ahmed is the man that leads Ethiopia. That's who he is. The man that leads Ethiopia. Yeah. The hope for yes. tomorrow the and hope beyond, of right? Tomorrow. Yes, absolutely. He is our shining star. Thank you so much, Nunu. Thank you so much. Nunu Waku is an Ethiopian American political analyst. Muslims and Christians in a small town in southern Niger have been worshipping in the same compound for more than 60 years. VOA reporter Haruna Mamane Bako brings us the story of a religious tolerance narrated here by Mahmoud Lalo. In a busy town on the Sahelian trade route cutting across southern Niger, Muslims and Christians have found a way to honor each other's religion. 98% of the people here in Bunungwani are Muslims, but that hasn't stopped them from sharing their compound with Christians. <laughs> Muslim Alaji Umar Osi says the town takes pride in its inclusion. This is really interesting to have church and mosque on the same ground, side by side. People are worshipping their Lord in peace without conflict. Christian Adme Pelaji Marius says it is religious acceptance built on mutual respect. Sincerely, we Christian women who are here in Burnungwani, we're living peacefully. We have no major differences with our neighbors. Muslim Romana Tunuhu says her mosque sharing a compound with the church helps bring two communities together. Sometimes they invite us to their ceremonies, even though we have different understanding about religion. This cannot be the reason not to stay together. Mayo Munkail Soka says that togetherness shows his town's commitment to peaceful coexistence. There are no problems between Muslim and the Christian in Berlin and it is our desire to build on the peace and tranquility. That tranquility has been strained at times. During renovation in 2011, the church was damaged by some young Muslims who also stole some items. Local Imam Malam Muhammad Udam Wazifa says Muslim leaders quickly came to their neighbor's defense. It was a little misunderstanding among some youth that resulted in arrest. We could not tolerate that. This area is known for peace and harmony, and conflict has always been resolved through communication. This enables us to have a better understanding of each other. Bunungwani Christian Arzigaladan says it was a moment that showed everyone the strength of cooperation here. When the unrest began, I was optimistic because it was not being carried out by people who are well-informed Muslims. Local politicians and religious leaders have worked together to promote religious acceptance here. District official Ibros Halifu Dangaladima says that makes Burnungwani an example for the nation. We are pleased with the level of peace here. Even if it's rare in Africa to have a church and a mosque within confined space, where people from both religions pray and live harmoniously. Following the 2011 incident, the church here was renamed Our Lady of Dialogue to reflect this town's commitment to religious tolerance. For Haruna Mamambakwe Bannakwani, Mahmoud Lalo, VOA News. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Still ahead on Africa 54, addressing the global funding for AIDS. But first, a look at Tuesday's headlines.
The Commission has not yet received figures from a few remote parts of the country. We've done a holistic review of top to bottom of where we can improve and we've tried to implement those actions. عارية. من نفعل الخير ربي بارك الله فيهم يعني ساعدوني الحق يعني It's time now for our health report and joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Mudu with an HIV AIDS update. Lino? That's right, Esther. As the International AIDS Conference ended in Amsterdam, one fact was clear. More money is needed to successfully address the global HIV AIDS epidemic. New data released at AIDS 2018 revealed a significant $6 billion gap between what is available for the response and what is needed now to ensure global access to prevention, treatment and care. In a recently released report titled Miles to Go, Closing Gaps, Breaking Barriers, Writing Injustices, UNAIDS stresses that achieving the 2020 targets would only be possible if investments from both donor and domestic sources increase. The United Nations AIDS Agency says global new HIV infections declined by just 18 percent and the decline was not quick enough to reach the target of fewer than 500,000 by 2020. A new UNAIDS report has found that gains made for children are not being sustained. New HIV infections among children have declined only 8% in the past two years, with just over half of all children living with HIV receiving treatment and 110,000 children dying from AIDS-related illnesses last year. The report also noted that discrimination by healthcare workers, law enforcement, teachers, religious leaders and others is preventing young people and people living with HIV, among others, from accessing HIV prevention, treatment and other sexual and reproductive health services. Joining me now for more on the global fight against HIV AIDS is Chris Collins, a president of the advocacy group Friends of the Global Fight Against AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. Mr. Collins, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So the International AIDS Conference ended. What is your assessment on what happens there? I think there's a sense that there's been a lot of great progress that we need to celebrate and we need to realize that we have great tools now to address the global HIV epidemic. But the, the truth is that I think there was a painful realization at the conference that we're getting off track in terms of uh, moving towards ending the epidemic and reaching those UNAIDS goals that you mentioned. So I think there's concern about that, mm -hmm. uh, that the money isn't there, but also that we're just not getting to scale with, with programming that works. There's a lot of buzz about TB because the United mm -hmm. Nations is having their uh, high-level meeting on tuberculosis later this year. And so many people see this as a great opportunity to shine a light on TB and the connection between TB and HIV. Yes, when we know that the co-infection is can, it's very, very detrimental to HIV-positive patients. Now, let's talk about something that was released a couple of weeks ago. UNAIDS really raised the, sounded the alarm on the fact that young women are really left behind in this big picture. What is your assessment? What is happening? It's a serious concern. You know, in Africa, 41% of people are under the age of 15. So you have a lot of people on the continent coming of age. And that's a wonderful opportunity for Africa. But there's also danger here because uh, young people are at the highest risk for acquiring HIV. So we really need to now get to scale with prevention services and treatment services for young people. Uh, young women are particularly at risk. In Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the infection rate among young women is eight times that in young men. So we need to really concentrate on what young women need to keep themselves safe. 
um, we need to think comprehensively, you know, about the healthcare services for sure, but also things like preventing violence and providing educational opportunities, economic opportunities for young women. So we really need a comprehensive approach. So a comprehensive approach, but what is really failing? If we were to pinpoint one or two main issues, is it basically economic? Does it have to do very much about economic or is it more with prevention? Actually, I think the biggest failure is in our policy as a okay. globe and then individual countries. I mean, we now have the tools to make great strides against HIV, and you're seeing that. Um, in fact, there was an announcement at the, at the conference about Namibia is now making great progress on getting treatment to people, getting their viral load controlled so they're absolutely healthy. Um, a lot of progress we're seeing in Eastern and Southern Africa but much less so in, in, in Western Africa, uh, parts of Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. So it, it really is a question of, we have great tools, mm -hmm. now we've got to go to scale with those tools and reach people most at risk. So in, as we look at uh, solutions, uh, what is your organization doing in, in this area? My organization uh, works on behalf of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria, and uh, the Global Fund provides about a fifth of all the international finance that goes into HIV. A little bit over half of what the Global Fund spends is on HIV. So what we try to do is get uh, the U.S. Uh, public and, and lawmakers to understand the great value of the U.S. investment. Uh, in the Global Fund. And we've got a big year coming up because replenishment for the Global Fund is going to be in 2019. So we're really working hard to show lawmakers about how it's important to uh, meet and increase the, the pledge that the U.S. has made uh, in the last three years. We need a, an increase from the U.S. And other, and other governments in the Global Fund this year. And how do we close the, the major gap? And, and we're going to leave it there. In financing? Yes, in funding. I think we also need uh, implementing countries that are most affected to uh, those that are able need to do more, but they are increasing the, their investments by 60% in the last 10 years. So that trend, and then we need to get donors back in the game. Okay, Chris Collins, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And that was uh, Chris Collins. He is president of the advocacy group Friends of the Global Fight Against AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lenore Moudou. Esther, back to you. Thanks, Lino. Be sure to watch Lino Moudou's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday on Africa 54. Now, every year, the Mandela Washington Fellowship brings together young people from 49 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. The fellowship is part of the Young Africa Leaders Initiative, or YALI, launched by President Barack Obama back in 2010. It gives young Africans the opportunity to spend a summer in the United States to study business, entrepreneurship, civil leadership, and public management. The YALI Fellows are in Washington this week for four days of networking, discussions, and talks. The summit marks the culmination of a six-week exchange program funded by the U.S. government and 38 American universities. And Africa 54's Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick is at the summit and joins us live from the Omni Shoham Hotel here in Washington. Hello, Heidi. Now, Heidi, Hello there, Esther. Yes, Heidi, uh, this program is facing some budget cuts, and uh, I'm just wondering what the future holds for the program. What are you hearing? Well, you know, Esther, we've been speaking to many of the Yali fellows. There are 700 of them in this building right here behind me. And, of course, they're very excited to be here. But the future of this program really is hanging in the balance. There are many questions about whether this program is going to survive. And so it's sort of been the elephant in the room here. You remember, this is an Obama-era program. It is funded in part by the U.S. government. And there is a big question right now about whether the funding for this program is going to continue. Um, 
you know, there is support in Congress from both Republicans and Democrats in the U.S. Congress to really keep this program going. Because remember, this is a two-way street. The YALI program is not just about Africans coming here, learning from Americans about how to do things, but it is also an opportunity for Americans to go to African countries and learn from Africans about Africa. So while there are many questions about the funding, there is still great support and people do see the value of investing in Africa's next generation of leaders. It is good for America. It is good for Africa. Many of the proponents say they say this is a relationship worth investing in. It will have a higher return on investment. So while the future hangs in the balance, there's a lot of positivity to focus on the now and the investment right now in this program and what the returns will be in future. Most people are curious, Haley, to see who is addressing the Yalis in this summit. Previously, we've seen President Barack Obama then addressing them. Who is the official guest in this summit? Well, there is going to be, of course, there is no President Barack Obama this year to do the, the address, but there is going to be a pre-recorded message from the daughter of the current President Donald Trump. His daughter, Ivanka Trump, is expected to um, give an address. And, of course, there is going to be a lot um, of questions about what that, ma that message is going to be about. People are very excited. I think the day for a lot of high-profile guests and officials will really be tomorrow. Today is just about networking sessions, learning about about leadership, um, learning about women's economic empowerment, African leaders, um, African youth leaders, um, but, you know, all remains to be seen what will be in that message. But I will tell you, Esther, you know, um, the young people here are much less starstruck about who's going to address them. They're far more focused on what their responsibility is. They have an, a unique opportunity, a unique privilege, and a lot of them are saying they are very excited to go back home and really share their experience and share their expertise. So I would say all eyes should be on this group of Yalis to see what they're going to do when they go home. Maybe they will be the generation that Nelson Mandela has dreamed of, the ones that are going to unite their efforts and really work to solve the problems of the continent. So well done, Haiti. Thank you so much. We look forward to those Yalis making a difference in the continent when they return. Haiti, thank you so much. Haiti Adams with Patrick reporting live from the Omni Shoham Hotel here in Washington. Now, former California Congressman Ron Dellums, who led a 15-year effort to enact U.S. sanctions against South Africa's apartheid government, has died. Dellums was co-founder of the Congressional Black Caucus and one of Capitol Hill's most tenacious liberal voices. He retired from the U.S. House of Representatives in 1998 after 27 years. One of Dellums' greatest political triumphs was the congressional enactment in 1986 over the veto of President Ronald Reagan of U.S. economic sanctions against the apartheid policy of racial separation by South Africa's white minority government. Ron Dellums was 82 years old. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings, today break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC Monday through Friday. Thanks for watching and good night from Washington. English in a minute. So you know what happy is, and medium comes between small and large. To find a happy medium. So is this idiom about feeling kind of happy? How is it going with your neighbor? Is he still complaining about your playing the trombone at night? He was, but it's fine now. How did you guys work it out?